call to order the uh, Finance, Operations, and Budget Committee meeting. Erica, if you'd yes, like thank to. thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, we're presenting the 2022-2023 superintendent budget proposal. Before I get started, Um, I just want to thank Melissa for putting the finishing touches on our PowerPoint presentation and making sure that it is color appropriate for yellow jackets. Thank you, Melissa. And RJ and Joe for their contributions relative to uh, the content. So with that being said, we only have an hour, so I'm going to go through these beginning slides a little quickly, but everybody's... We're moving right to item number two. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the mission of the East Haven Public Schools, provide a variety of learning experiences and a rigorous comprehensive education in a safe and nurturing environment so that all of our students could be college and or career ready. Um, it's all over. This is what we ground ourselves and our work in every single day and what our budget here this evening is reflective of. Some of our belief statements, they've been hanging in this room for a very long time but in the East Haven community, that all individuals can learn, that all of individuals have value, building trusting and positive relationships. All individuals have an ethical responsibility to themselves and one another, in fiscal responsibility and fair allocation of resources, safe and positive learning environments, and in respecting our diversity. And our budget embodies all of these beliefs. The Board of Education has set goals. They are um, around coat, culture and climate, operations, academics and talent. And the budget that we're presenting to you this evening support every single one of those four goals and the subcategories subcate within. So just some data and information prior to RJ and team coming up and talking more explicitly about the budget. But here is some four-year enrollment history. And you can see last school year, we were at 2,897 students. This school year, we have 2,955 students. Those numbers are comparable and in include students in grades pre-K-12 attending the high school. Our 55 outplaced special education students are 13 open choice students that are bused in from New Haven um, and are also, um, the total is 2955 with students attending Magnets and VOAG. Now while our enrollment last year was around just under 3,000, you should know that we are still fiscally responsible for 410 students attending those Magnet schools in New Haven. Even though it's free to attend those Magnet schools and we do get reimbursed um, for transportation if we provide it, if New Haven provides it, they pay for the transportation. We are still fiscally responsible for any service a la carte that those students receive in those magnet schools. Um, some additional data, we are up six students for being homeschooled. For, we had 40 last year, we're up to 46 this year. And 84 students are currently attending independent and parochial schools. We've seen sort of a stabilization in our enrollment, and we are not expecting any um, drastic enrollment increases or declines. Do you want to have to wait till the end for questions? Please. Go? No, just if you let me get through some of these slides and then so write your questions down and we can go back and answer them. So East Haven Public School staffing. Um, here's a little trend data of staffing over time. It's certified, non-certified, and then uh, full-time equivalent. Um, you can see um, there's some charts here at the bottom. These two pie graphs, they compare the percentage of students and educators for three major race and ethnicity categories. Um, and those categories are black, Hispanic, Latino, and white you can see that relative to our student population, which I'll show a breakdown in a minute, we have a limited diverse staffing population. These pie charts are the full-time equivalent of educators working part-time and, and they are counted as a fraction for full-time. For example, a teacher who works two of the five days per week would be counted as a 0.4 FTE. This, these pie charts, here, you can take a look at the district administrators in the orange and a comparison to the state. 
So you can see the percentage uh, breakdown of employees relative to category. District administrators, instructional specialists, school administrators, student support services, general education teachers, library, media, and special ed teachers. And you can see that our makeup isn't too drastically different from the state's. Let's just take a look at our students. Um, currently, 56% of our total student population is white, 32% is Hispanic, 5% are black, and 3.9% are Asian. We have 9.1% English learners, and you can see that that number has climbed over the past several years and has sort of leveled out just under 10%. Um, we are comparative to the state, and it equates to about 260 some odd students. That is a moving target as students test and take the loss assessments, which is the language assessment scale. They eventually can test out of English language services and enter regular education programming. Um, currently, our district has 15.9% students with disabilities. These are students with individualized education um, programs, or IEPs, as sometimes it's referred to. They are, does not include students with Section 504 plans. That is a completely separate um, identification. Over the course of the past several years, the percentage of our special education students has increased. Sometimes we like to think that it's because of the programming that we've built, and I'm going to share some additional special ed data with you that breaks it down by special education category. And you'll see that the largest percentage we have are students with autism, and we have a pretty comprehensive program that Bob and his team have built over time. Here's some graduation college and career readiness information. Um, our graduation rate last year was 79%. Um, stable from 1920. We have, um, you can see in the, the orange line is the state. So comparatively speaking to the state, um, a little closer back in 1617, 1718, the gap widens from 1819 through last school year. Um, college and career readiness, part of our mission statement, we get um, accountability report from the state where this is a a target for us in terms of our accountability index and we have drastically worked to increase that percentage. Um, last year 82 percent of our students were taking college or career uh, readiness courses. Um, in terms of on track this is the percentage of, of ninth grade students who are earning five or more credits after their freshman year and that number in uh, 1920 was around 88 percent and our self-projected uh, rate, it's not out from the state or confirmed yet, uh, based on our initial data submission to the state, is at 85% of our ninth grade students on track to graduate. That's a key indicator and an indicator we pay very close attention to as it is a predictor and eventually impacts our four-year graduation rate. Here's some information on special education and pupil services. Uh, all all of the K-2 students for the district is fiscally responsible. This chart over here is a uh, shows the percentage of students with disabilities by primary disability category. You can see that 17.2% of the total students identified as needing special education services are students with autism. 6.3% are students who have been identified with emotional disturbance just under 4% uh, for intellectual disability. Almost 40% of our special education students are identified because of a learning disability. 9.2% for any other disability not classified here. Uh, almost 14% for some other health-related impairment. And um, just over 10% of our students receive speech and language services. And again, those categories are the percentage of students identified as special education students classified in each one of those categories. It is by law mandatory that students with uh, disabilities are included and have time with non-disabled peers. We have to report that on an annual basis um, to the State Department of Education. Um, so 55.3% um, of our students um, are with non-disabled peers and they have to spend at least 79 to 100% of their time with non-disabled peers 
based on their individualized program by law. Sometimes you hear us refer to some of those um, instances like inclusion. Here's just a few other uh, measures. Um, we've been focused on chronic absenteeism. If our students aren't here, we can't educate them. We worked really hard prior to the pandemic to get that number down. You can see we were trending downwards. Um, but last year, given quarantines and illnesses, we popped up to 20%. So that means that 1.5, I mean one out of every five students in East Haven is chronically absent, which means they're missing 10% or more of the school year based on the number of days of membership. So if Tom Hennessy is in school for 30 days and he misses three days of school, he is classified as being chronically absent. If Jen Piercy is in school for 180 days and she misses 18 days of school, excused, unexcused, doesn't matter, she gets reported to the state as being chronically absent. So a student who comes here for two weeks, 10 days, misses one day and decides to move somewhere else, chronically absent. 10% of the total school days based on their membership. Um, here are the percentage of our students eligible for free and reduced price meals. I know that we're community eligible. Everybody receives free um, breakfast and free lunch. However, these numbers are just based off of the state's direct certification list. So 54.6% of our students automatically qualify under TAMF or SNAP for free and reduced lunch, which is a list we receive every single um, month from um, the state of Connecticut. So no application, nothing, it's just they're identified through the state, that list gets sent to us, and that's reflective of this number. Um, we no longer do free and reduced lunch applications. So if, if we did applications, that number would probably be a little bit higher. Um, and I just want to make that, that clear is that number is directly reported based on a direct certification from the state from TAMF and SNAP benefits. So I am going to turn it over to RJ and team. They're going to take you through uh, the remainder of the budget that focuses on um, the key highlights and the overview for the requested increase. RJ? Thank you. So I think this slide you are all familiar with. Um, I will walk you through this briefly. I'll walk you through our process. I'm going to turn it over to Joe to go through the drivers of this budget change and our request. And then we will um, wrap it up with any other questions and items that we need to look forward to as we progress through the process. So going through our budget proposal, we are asking in total for an increase of $920,835, which is 1.9%. You can see that predominantly our changes primarily between contractual changes to our salaries, our benefits, and our retirement benefits. We have gone through all the other lines. You can see the numbers in red are where we have shaved expenses or found some cost savings to offset some of those in increases so we can present an honest and reasonable budget to you all this evening. Our next slide is just to show in a pie chart how our breakdown is comparative. The large blue piece is our salaries followed by our orange piece, which is employee ben our employee benefits. So almost predominantly, almost 80% of our budget is salaries and benefits. And benefits includes retirement, pensions, Social Security, the whole nine yards for in there. So with that, our process this year, I believe, is a little bit different than it was in the past. Um, we have utilized, oh, next slide, sorry. Our budget process. So we have utilized our general ledger system more detailed this process. In the past, it was done primarily outside in Excel spreadsheets with larger figures brought in line item by line item, where this year we were able to identify each individual staff member, roll them forward, and tie them to their actual contract. So all the figures here are tied to contracts, tied to contractual in increases, and that relates. The system automatically calculates fed, um, Social Security when applicable. It, it, it'll calculate the pension um, contributions, Social Security, and so on. With that, we feel it's a more precise driver for us. If a change is made now, it's more easily spread through the process and through uh, future years as well. 
Um, with that being said, that was our starting point when we did this. We rolled all employees over. We, we tied them to contract changes, and we came up with that starting basis point. We then met with all department heads and principals and detailed their budget line by line. We went through and analyzed all of their asks and requests, and we did that in a manner where we tried to address some of their needs currently and balance their needs in the future being financially responsible. Um, we also, in that, again, so performed in-depth cost analysis. We went through some lines beyond the salary lines to, to go back in prior years, some five, six years, to get historic costs for certain line items and make sure our budget was reflective of what historic costs were rather than just getting a flat number that was rolled forward year to year with a, with a, a normal inflation rate. So we feel we have provided a con, um, uh, you may see some fluctuation line to line, but it's going to be more precise in lines where it may have been more of a round number in years past. Um, we also identified opportunities to utilize grant funding where it's possible, both current when we met with those staff, if we were able to um, satisfy our request in current year using current grant funding, we tried the best we could to not stress the operational funds. So we feel, again, this is the most, um, so the proposed budget to you this evening, we all believe is financially responsible and hopefully you are happy with it this evening. So with that, I am going to um, bring you through, again, a quick waterfall before I turn it over to Joe, who will hit these points individually in more depth. So our salary line, the increase is um, $500,000. Our last year's budget, you'll see, is $48 million. So we're going to walk forward all our large changes to get to the current ask of 48.9. So our salaries figure is $500,000, and that is made up of the contractual increases of $700,000, position changes of $100,000, increased custodial overtime of $100,000, and we've built in a, a retiree resignee savings line this year, which is new to the budget process. Again, Joe will explain that as we progress. Um, in addition, the MRF is a obligation given to us by the state of Connecticut, the percentage that we must send to the state is provided to us. That, that gave us an increase of $300,000. Our medical insurance, the operational fund, we are projecting to be a $200,000 change. Um, tuition and supplies and property coming in at a net loss or a net gain for us of $100,000. So that in total gives us a proposed budget of the $48.9 million. So Joe, I think our next slide will be when Joe can begin. He will walk us through each individual line here in depth of how we came up with those calculations. So I will bring up Joe Rossi to take you through a little further. Joe. Thank you, RJ. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Joe Rossi, a new finance manager in the district. Uh, I'm sure, I'd love to shake some hands afterwards and, and meet people face to face. Uh, for the time being, though, I'll just run through some numbers. So, <clears throat> as RJ said, I will be going through the facts that he just showed on the last slide, and that'll essentially be how we determine these budget driver, these changes, essentially. So, um, if I talk too fast, please stop me. I have a tendency to do that. I will try to slow down. This is our salary budget drivers. <clears throat> as you can see, the, first, the top section is just a repeat of what we showed in the previous slide just to drive home that these are the four, the four key pieces to the salary change. Contractual increases, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. This is every current teacher moving up a step. Position changes, uh, we have highlighted down here. The position changes specific to this budget are one new music teacher at JMMS, one new special ed teacher at Deer Run, one new special ed teacher at East Haven Academy, a .5 FTE administrative assistant here at the high school, specific to the assistant principals. A .4 FTE library aid at Deer Run. And I should say, and RJ mentioned this, these were the outcomes of the departmental and principal meetings. They said, these are what we need. So we took all those increases and attempted to fully fund it. I shouldn't say that because we did not fully fund it, but we offset some of that cost with seven vacant pair of positions. We, as part of the roll forward process, any vacant position that was yet to be filled that is out to be filled was rolled forward as an open position, as you know, a budget item. So uh, we, in order to pay for these position changes, we removed seven pair of positions. 
The net impact to that is $80,000, and that's the point one here. So there is an $80,000 increase due to positional changes, and these are those positions. Custodial overtime uh, is, was just frankly under budgeted in previous budgets. I don't have many more comments other than that it was about $100,000 under budgeted. The, the true actual cost has been coming in higher than the budget over the past two years, and so we made an adjustment there. Uh, the final item here uh, is retiree resignee savings. Here's a little blurb about that as well. You can read it. I'll also explain it. The idea is essentially, and I feel like a lot of people here are aware of it because I know it had been told to me as something that people are aware of. Um, oftentimes you might have a retiree, very top step, replaced by someone, certainly at a lower step, maybe even the lowest step. As a result, for every retiree, there's an expected savings. They will, again, come off at a high salary, and the new replacement will be at a low salary. So that will generate savings for us. We did an analysis over the past couple years and looked at the actual retirees and resignees and determined A, how many, and B, how much per. We determined that the retirees, that's the big number, they save about $40,000 per resignees, which is the same exact idea, but they're not all the way at the top step yet. They're mid-career, so they're mid-step. The same effect, but less impact. Uh, we saw an average savings on those of about 15000 I'm kind of speaking a little bit from memory. I recall that the number of retirees and resignees we saw last year was 29. 29. We are looking at 16. I don't have an exact split of that 29 of retirees versus resignees. And Jen, if, if I'm way out, of, way, out of league, way out of line, tell me. Um, but we had to make a conservative estimate, took six retirees at 40,000, that's 240,000. And 10 resignees at 15,000, that's 150,000. Total, 390. And that's our 0.4 savings right there. Let me just check my notes to see if there's anything else that I want to refer to. Just a couple other notes. So I mentioned that we reduced seven vacant para positions. There are still 11 in the budget. Still 11 vacant. I just want to make that, you know, just mention it. Uh, the last point. Um, is that the in the departmental meetings, and I think this is a state mandate, don't hold me to that, or not state mandate, but Erica would, would again, tell me if I'm out of line on that one, um, that there was a big requirement or request for bilingual teachers, and we are adding bilingual teachers, but that is going in under grant funding, which I think we'll talk about, RJ might mention later as well, but I just want to mention that there are additional positions being added, especially in the bilingual space, uh, and those are being covered by grants. So they're not applicable here and they're not being included in this salary increase. So by law, if you have 20 um, students who speak the same language in one school, regardless of grade level, you have to create a bilingual program. You have two years to create that bilingual program. One year, one year is a planning year and the following year is implementation. We currently have one bilingual uh, full-time certified individual in district and um, given our numbers and the concentration of the same languages spoken in, in one school, we are in need of adding another bilingual educator for next year. It will be grant funded, but it is um, legislatively driven. Um, and some years while we post and we can't find a bilingual teacher and we make that best attempts, we send that information to the state, the number of times it was posted, the number of it interviews that we held, the reasons why the candidates might not have been qualified or um, met our expectations, um, but we're really hoping, given some of the recent certification programs and um, state programming on creative ways to expand existing certifications and get people and individuals through shortage area certification programs, we're hopeful that we can hire a bilingual educator to meet the requirement for our district next year. Can you, can you tell us what a bilingual program is? Yeah. Do so they it, speak that other language in the classroom? They could support kids in the classroom in their native language. Right now, our bilingual educator splits between two schools, Tuttle and Mamalwin mm -hmm. School. Um, the individual is not self-contained, so she does not have her own classroom at Tuttle School or at Mamalwin School with kids from kindergarten to fifth grade speaking the same language in the same classroom. We do a push-in model for bilingual support um, services, and oftentimes, for 
for complete non-English speakers, we are supporting those individuals um, in their native language. And that could include also curric through curricular yeah, resources, so books, text. The textbooks could be yes, in that language. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, and Jen, correctly if I'm wrong, no. but isn't the Smarter Balance Assessment translated mm -hmm. for English yeah. language learners? Or they have the option to have the Smarter Balance Assessment read to them in English? Mm -hmm. So is the, is the thought process though to eventually move to English or yeah yeah or do you want to teach that class in a different language? So that's a that's a really great question. Um, research on language development and second second language acquisition says that kids who um, come from homes where other languages are spoken, if they are um, if they can read, if they can write, and if they can speak in their primary language. The transference over to English is a lot better, and it usually happens within a five to seven year period. Kids who come to us who might have, you know, not solid language skills in their primary language, may not be able to read or write um, at a, a basic interactive or academic level, um, who are coming to us, that transference into English takes a lot longer. And there's tons of research on that second language acquisition. Um, our goal is to support the kids in their primary language until they get to a point where we can transfer them to be able to read and write and speak English effectively. And we do that through immersion, which means putting kids in an environment where they can hear other um, English speakers. And we use sheltered um, instruction strategies to make the content comprehensible for them, to reduce the linguistic load, to use pictures and cues so they can understand what's going on. The idea is, is to get them to a level of proficiency where when they take that loss assessment, that language assessment um, scale um, assessment, that they're scoring at a high enough level where they exit the bilingual or the need for English language services. Hasn't the requirements changed though from the state on that? No. It, it did? In terms of requirements for a program? No, no, not for the program, for the students. For There's a cutoff score for the last links yeah. where they have to actually meet proficiency on reading, writing, speaking, vocabulary. Um, and if they meet the assessment score on that state, it's like a high stakes state test. Every, every English learner identified in the state of Connecticut takes the last links, the last assessment. If they meet certain scores on each one of those subcategories on that assessment, then they've met the proficiency to exit as an, an English learner. I knew there was a change though, just like this past year or it's coming up. I was reading it in the upcoming legislation. No one else? This, this, the students who took the last assessment, last it's usually implemented between February and April. Um, that was the same as it was the year before and we're anticipating implementing it the same this February to April. Okay. There may be something coming up and some change, but I haven't been notified by um, the State Department of Education. Okay. But again, just to be clear, the additional bilingual teacher is not in this budget. Okay, uh, moving on, next driver, and I didn't write it here, but the, this was a $300,000 upcharge. This is for MRF, AKA Municipal Employment, Employee Retirement Fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, okay, so uh, with the uh, Municipal Employee Retirement, obviously the employee pays into it, but the uh, district also has a requirement to pay into it as well. This requirement is set by the state. Um, without reading all this, I'll just walk you through, the, uh, through this chart. We are on the second line. My arrow is unfortunately a little bit off, but we are on the second line. General without Social Security. Uh, we are, our current year is full year 2022. Notice that this chart says the rate, this chart was published uh, previously. I, I don't have an exact date, but this is not a current chart. This is an old chart. Um, the expected rate for 2022 was 18.25. The way it works is there's an actuarial committee that act, that sets the standards for the expected rates. And notice I put expected in quotes because I'm trying to drive home this, this fact. They expect the rates to be a certain amount, then they convene and publish the actual rates. This year, they expected 18.25, the actual was 19.0, and that's what we are in fact paying now. Uh, 
based on the same chart, next year is 20.26. Based on our estimate from HR, using that same type of logic, we are kind of guessing what the, what the actuarial is going to say. We are using an estimate of 22% right now. Um, really, it's as simple as that. Going from 19 to 22% is causing an increase of $300,000. And this is essentially uh, not every, uh, maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but not every employee in the district is on MRF, but it's just as simple as taking 19 or 22% of their salary, and, and you know, of course that 3% is driving the increase there. Is, is that 19% of their gross wages? Correct. Yes. Uh, okay, our next driver is tuition. Uh, again, I should have put, them, put what the actual upcharge was. Uh, it was on the previous slide, but this was a $100,000 increase. Um, this is just a quick little chart of, um, of basically the situation. So the tuition split by the various buckets here, VOAG, Magnet, Special Education, Public, Private, and ESY. Um, first column is the current year budget. Second column is our expected cost. The third column is the excess cost grant offset. And then the final column is what we're putting into the budget. So a note about this. Um, I think Erica, oops, Erica alluded to the concept of these out-of-school people that we have to pay tuition for. Um, the 2023 cost estimate, so the second column here was provided by Pupil Services, and this is the specific expected tuition we, we should see. And we applied the excess cost grant offset. Now, I don't know what the knowledge level is of the excess cost grant. Bob certainly knows a lot about it. I can just repeat what he has told me, and that is... The excess cost grant is essentially the actual tuition paid at one of these outside schools minus the per pupil cost in school times a factor times another factor. Bottom line, it is the, they will reimburse us for some amount of how much more it costs to send them to the other school than it costs to send them here. In the past, this grant has been 1.1 million, sorry, I should say last year, or no, last year of the budget meeting this year, the grant is 1.1 million. We assumed 800,000 just to be a little conservative, um, and that is how we came up with the 3.92. So essentially this 20, I, I, one other point to clarify, this first column is what's in the budget already and after this exact same treatment. This budget column here all the way to the left corresponds to the budget column here all the way to the right. This excess cost treatment had already been done in the previous budget. We're just spelling it out and showing what's going on. In the end, we're saying the tuition is increasing from our, our you know, what we're going to pay on tuition is increasing from 3.84 to 3.92, $80,000. And this is based on, as I said, actual number of students, costs as provided by pupil services. Yes, that's a great point. And then we have a section later where we'll talk about what could change, and this certainly is something that could change. Medical insurance. Okay, here we go. We have a couple slides on this one. Um, I know, uh, you know people, people are aware of this one to some extent as well. Um, first, what I will do is just walk through the calculation in terms of how we got there, and then we can start looking at some of the pieces. Um, so... We are estimating 2023 total claims paid to be $9.1 million. We have a slide in terms of how we got to that number. The employee contribution, we expect to be $1.9 million. This was provided by Brown and Brown. Um, and their analysis is part of this whole thing as well. I'll allude to it later as well. Uh, we, have, we calculated a grant absorption piece of $1.3 million. And just a quick note on how this is calculated. It's mentioned on here. But... We had, uh, let me check my notes. Excuse me. We have 287 employees on the medical insurance, of which 43 are, in, are otherwise paid for in grants. So essentially we took medical charge divided by 287 times 43. That's essentially how we came up with the 1.3. Um, and that will be the piece that goes to grants. That leaves 5.8 million for the town budget. The town budget last year was 5.0 million. That leaves us an increase of 800,000 versus last year. We, our current plan, and this is certainly something to discuss, but our current plan, and this is what we have built into the budget, 
is to take 600,000 from the current medical reserve, which is the $4.9 million account, and have 200,000 absorbed into the general fund. And I'll just pause for one second while I collect my thoughts. Sure. Has anyone checked with the grant providers, whoever that is, the state of Connecticut, whoever, to ensure it works calculatively? The how we put the medical cost to the grant. So I, I read. Well, at one time, I think we used the actuarial number. That's crazy. Yep. That's wrong. Right. Um, you mean the, the the numbers that they use to calculate the premium cost share? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, but, was always around $29,000. Yeah, so putting that to it doesn't seem right to me. Uh -huh. And this method, I understand, it sounds more accurate to me, but has anyone gone to the authority to grant issuer and make sure that this method is correct? No, but generally speaking, I write a lot of the grants, yeah. and there's a 200 line in the grant, which is a benefit line. Yeah. And in there, we've written FICA, we've, we've written MRF, we've written health and medical benefits hmm. and we say you know two FTEs and uh, medical benefits and then we put the amount per plan sometimes it was 29,000 mm -hmm. this budget suggests we use 31,000 I write that into the grant the grant gets submitted to the State Department of Education I'm assuming if they had questions on how that was calculated they would reach out to us I know but we could reach out to that I would and be find careful out. with that because I understand the fight here and the birth and all that that's a real number but I hope we all understand that that 29,000 you talk about is fake. It's an actuarial number. It has nothing to do with our health insurance cost. Meaning that like, for instance, a grant, mm -hmm. a person on the general fund could break their leg and go to the hospital and have a lot of claims, and a person on the general fund could have no injuries and have no claims paid. So this one has 10,000 and this one has zero. That's is that right. what you mean? That, that is totally fair. I, I mean, I see your point. I don't, yeah. I see your point, yes. Perhaps out and see if you have I, any suggestions we'd be interested no, in I, your input. I don't understand who the authority is and all that stuff, but I'm just telling you, if you're using, which we used to use that actuarial number, it's fake. Yeah. That's, it, that's I would a fake number. The, the first thing that comes to my mind, and I could be way wrong in saying this though, is we couldn't have any more specifics because then that would be, we would need to know the people and the injuries, that's and right. that's, you, can, you obviously can't cross that line, you know. You like, can't. You and can. You, yes. Okay. And it would have to be you would take last year's data and throw a factor into this year. But I mean, I mean, like medical. I mean, like doctor client I privilege is what I'm saying. Calculate the renewal rate based well, on the health of the. But I'm just. I'm not group. saying. I'm saying we should. That scares me. That number. That's a lot of money. It's 1.3 million dollars. I'd hate to have someone come in and say, Hey, you know what? You haven't been doing this right for the last three years. That, we can, we that, can get fair on that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we can certainly check it with the auditor, you know, no problem. Um, okay, before I move on, because there's, there's, this is obviously a complicated thing. I know we're holding questions, but does, does anyone have a question about this before I move on? Because now I'm going to the individual pieces of this. I'm glad to see we're using the medical reserve, finally. Because that's what that's telling us there is we're taking 600000 out of our balance in the medical reserves yeah. to plug the hole in the budget. Correct. I, I so think that that's a great idea. So that the operational budget increases only 200000 instead of... Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I'm glad to see that. And, and just because I'll skip, I'll skip back, but just because we're talking contribution, we have a slide on that as well. Um, really, it's the same facts that you just mentioned, but just as a refresher, this is the 4.95. This is how much we have in the medical reserve at this point. This was the calculation that I believe RJ had performed, um, where it, and, I, and I believe this was a board-sanctioned concept, where we want a minimum balance of 125%. That's 2.8 million. Obviously, simple math, we're over about 2 million. It, you know, we have 2 million to yeah. start reducing. Yeah. So, and this was RJ's concept as well. Well, let me, before I make the final point, let me go back up here. So, um, what is going on with medical? The claims are going way up. That's what's going on with medical. The claims are going way, way up based on the, based on the pandemic. This is a graph just showing simply claims over the years. Now, oops, for those in the know, um, the, there was an issue in 2020 
where the number that was reported, uh, there was a, let me read my notes, sorry. When we, when we left ACES, there was a balance of a million dollars that ACES held, continued holding. We used half of that to pay claims, um, and the other half they also held to pay claims. So in the end, the number that was reported as the, sorry, the, they took that off the top of the claims, so the claims that we were showing was a million short. I adjusted it here. That was in two, 2020. Long story short, it showed seven, it was eight. We could talk more about that, but that's what we did here. So we're showing the claims over the years. These last two, the orange is the estimate we're using, 9.1. The blue here, 2022 and 2023, uh, are the current brown and brown estimates. As you can see, pandemic starts about here. Costs just start going up and up. Brown is, uh, I think that's 9.6. I think the 9.5 or 9.6 is what they're projecting. We looked at these numbers and, oh yeah, 9.5 right there, sorry. Um, and in our, we took, we, basically what we did is we took post -pandemic, a post-pandemic average, including the brown and brown numbers, and that's how we got to the 9.1. And let me see if, uh, okay, so in the, the, um, the upshot of this is, as I said, claims are just going up. Um, and so, the concept is to prudently use that medical reserve to soften the blow to the budget. If we did not, if we did not have the medical reserve, we would be asking for a lot more money right now, you know, $800,000 more or $600,000 more at least. So the idea is to drain off some of the medical reserve over the you know, course of a few years, I don't know exactly what it would look like, to get down to that 2.8, to also not hit the general fund all at once with a million dollars. So the idea, I, you know, we could discuss it, but I think the underscored idea here is this might happen next year too, and next year, the year after that. Okay. Um, this is uh, some comment, just some commentary regarding some of the other lines that we really haven't mentioned yet. Frankly, these are smaller items, but they're worth mentioning, so I'll go through them quickly. Um, these apply to the 56, 5700 lines, later the lower lines in the budget. Um, electricity, we just did a cost analysis and saw that we were over budgeted, so we reduced that by 60,000. Tech equipment, and this includes you know, Chromebook, Chromebooks, TVs, iPads, things like that. Uh, we saw temporary relief due to grant funding uh, because of a lot of these coronavirus uh, grants. Um, and, and at all, there's other ones as well. We were able to, you know, we have normal annual purchases, but we were able to put those in grants this year, so that saved our general fund. Um, and then offsetting that, we had some just general software increases and some of the um, school equipment increases per the principal's requests, things like desks, you know, things like that, chairs, desks, little things. Um, the, uh, we're not showing it here, but just one other comment. Um, on maintenance, we're not showing here because it's a net zero, but in the maintenance department, we um, made a few changes. So we are adding a new box truck. Again, this is per request, but adding a new box truck, but um, paying for it by ending uh, the, the storage lease on Short Beach Road. Um, there will also be an additional storage to make up, storage container rented to make up for the loss of that property, but the net impact is, is zero of all those changes. Last slide here uh, is really just for informational purposes. Um, obviously it's not germane per se, well I should say it is germane, but it is not specifically tied to the operational budget. This is our expectation of grant funding. Um, these are really just, uh, this is our current grant funding. But we expect it to be the picture next year as well. So this top section is recurring grants that happen every year. Um, and the bottom is one-time grants. These are specifically related to, related to coronavirus. The only note I should make about all this is that the, the one-time grants are mostly already earmarked. This is, this is not open funding to do whatever we want with. Almost all of this is earmarked already, but this is the grant funding. Or, sorry, I should say, the expected grant funding. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back to RJ.
Okay, so lastly, there's just some variables that we wanted to point out. Variables being things that, you know, when we roll forward in our GL system to prepare this operating budget, you, know, you have to draw a line in the sand to move things forward. So with that being said, there's items such as our medical insurance. You know, we just received the estimate from Brown and Brown a week ago to compile this, this, this budget. Our claims are based off of the last five years and the last three months of this fiscal year. Those claims can either go drastically in our favor or against us. So any changes that are drastic will need to be reflected in this medical calculation so we can properly um, reflect the operating budget accordingly. Um, the workers' comp estimate, I assume, will change as well. So with workers' comp, that number has been flat over the last few years. That is charged directly from um, the town to us. In the past, um, the board had advised us to go out and check market prices to see if we were competitive with what we were actually being charged. Um, late summer, that happened. It also happened to be the same time when the town was going out to do that same process. So we couldn't be out independently at the same time getting quotes for the same market. So we pulled our quote back. The town has received quotes, and we are working hand in hand with the town to get a good figure in place. But once it's early, it's only middle, uh, beginning of December, that number will become more concrete as we progress. So again, that will change as we move forward in this process Sorry, as well. So what I do know for sure is they went out to bid on workers' comp, and once they receive those quotes, we will engage in discussions on what our share will be of that. So we don't know the due date for the bid? To be when, we, when we started preparing this budget, there wasn't any movement on that uh, as of yet. All right. So did they go out for a premium-based plan, or are they going out to bid for someone to run our self-insurance? I am, I am not sure what they did. Yeah. For the comp, yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree, yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah. So once once they come back with a final number of what they went out to bid on, we can we can discuss that further once we get final fi figures there. Um, also, something that will change, um, as Joe had mentioned, we have that new item in our budget this year for resignations and retirements, where we are factoring in when someone retires, there is going to be a cost saving. So we don't want to inflate what we're asking for for an expenditure. But that number of retirees and resignations may change from month to month. There has been times where we get an influx that let us know in May for June, or there's times where we have one that notified us a week ago and they're going to retire in a month. So what we have in there we feel is very conservative and any change would be in our favor, but we didn't want to go there yet without having some concrete facts as we progress throughout the year. Um, also, as information becomes more clear and precise along um, certain contractual changes in our demographics and student population, if we get an influx of English, English learners and we need to make a change and add special staffing, that's a change that needs to be made in the now. So any changes that happen based on student demographics or any changes that are needed at schools will be reflected in this current year's budget, but the down effect will be in next year's budget. So any of those changes that happen will also take place and be changed in this budget as, as we progress. Um, and also, if there's any new initiatives that the board wants to take on in this current budget, if we make any changes from now until we finalize this budget, all those changes will need to be flushed out through future years. So as much as we are very comfortable with this number presented, just wanted to make you all aware that there will be some variables in these figures that will change as we progress closer to finalizing and voting on a final approval to bring to town council. Um, we also would want to say, so we can get to our summary slide. So basically last year, our current budget is $48,044,271. We received a $50,000 increase last year, which is 0.1%. Um, this year we, are at, we would ask, as of right now, for $48,965,106, which is a $921,000 roughly increase, which is just under 2% which we believe um, predominantly supports our contractual changes. We tried to present a budget that was not asking 
any burden put back on the town more than just contractual changes, and we're actually coming in less than contractual salary, med medical, and retirement. Um, so with that being said, that is our presentation from the budget standpoint. I know we will meet again. I want you all to know like your binder tonight has two large budget by object, budget by project in there. It's just the same program, sorry. And it's just broken down in different manners. There's also one by location. So you will see a budget for each individual school. You'll see one for district-wide costs, which are not identifiable to each individual school, such as copy machines. That's a cost shared by the district, and it's just shown on one project. So when you're going through this, um, when you leave here tonight, we will put something out for questions. But if there are any questions to specific lines, please reach out to myself or Joe. We can get together. You can come in. We can walk through them. Um, and then when we come to our next meeting, we'll have another workshop, hopefully in the next few weeks, where we can get together like this again, hash out some ideas, make some changes if need be, and move forward together. We're going to follow up the presentation with a Google form, where after you take a look at the budget, you might want to go through section by object, right, and then take a look at it by program. Once you do that, make some notes in your budget. We'll put out a Google form. We want you to add all the questions that you have. We'll go through all those questions, we'll provide some answers, some additional slides, and we'll present the responses to the question to everybody so that you can see the questions and the responses. And we'd like to do that um, at, the, at a workshop prior to the January 11th regular meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. And in the interim, happy to answer anything in between that might be prohibiting you from interpreting or, or working with the budget between now and then. Because eventually, the superintendent's budget needs to become the Board of Education's uh, proposed budget. And we will be asking the board for approval and to vote on that budget at the end of January so that it can get to town hall by February 3rd um, as our formal, as the formal Board of Education request. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Can you ask questions now? We, do. Mm -hmm. we have five minutes, yes. All right. So in your, in your presentation, you made note there was 13 open choice students. Yes. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Because a lot of people have been asking me because of the fighting up here. They're, they have this belief those are kids who came in from New Haven and open choice. How, what is open choice? How does it work? How do you apply? How do we accept, accept someone on the work? Okay, so good question. There's 13 open choice students, and those open choice students range from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. The open cho choice program was in district when I got here, and from what I understand, it has been a long-standing program. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that the same way, but I just want to say one thing. I only remember us letting kids in elementary. Every, so I'm getting there. Go ahead. Okay, all right. so it's a program run through ACES where neighboring districts um, allow students from New Haven to come into or surrounding urban areas to come into schools, um, East Haven Public Schools. Every year, ACES, and actually I just got it today from Lynn Daly at ACES, sends a form where the district gets to fill out the number of vacancies that we have for open choice. We look at the number of 12th grade students who are leaving our district, and we use that to create the number of kindergarten students to enter. So I think, and, and don't hold me to this, but last year we had three 12th grade open choice students who graduated. We wrote to Lynn Daly at ACES and said we have three kindergarten um, open choice positions available. And that's, that's how it's worked for as long as I've been in district. And I've so, assumed that so protocol. So that 13 doesn't change ever? It's been 13 for a very long time. Well, it has to be. I do, know, yes, three. I do know that there has been, um, they do have a wait list of a lot of kids who want to come in. But from my understanding, that's how it's been done. Okay. And I've taken over that process um, when I took over as a so we have, superintendent. We only take kids in a K. We don't take in a uh, high school sophomore. But they eventually get to be high They do. Oh, well, sure. They but they've been with us for a few years. We've had many open choice students graduate here who 
have been incredibly successful. In fact, there's families that have siblings in multiple grade levels throughout the entire system. So um, that's generally how, how we have worked in. I got one more thing yes. for you, but well, you're going to have to get this for me. So I've heard you the last couple of years say we're fiscally responsible for can you get that number for me? For the number of kids? No, I know what the number of kids is. Can oh. you, the dollar amount that those kids cost us? The 55 outplaced students, the, four, the, the, the services for the 400 plus yeah. magnet students. The services the that Boag, you have to provide to them. The, the services for VOAG, yeah. I can work with Bob's office to get that. Get us that number. Thank you. Erica? Yes. I have to review a question um, on this yeah, chronically absent. Is there a number where a student reaches X amount of days that they automatically have failed that year? 18. No, we jumped right into the budget. 18, you're identified as chronically absent, right? So if you're missing, if you attend school for 180 days a year and you've missed 18 or more days, you're classified and reported to the state as being chronically absent, right? At the high school level, attendance is attached to credits. So they're in the, in the handbook. The high school has very clear guidelines about semester courses versus year-long year -long courses. And the number of days that you can miss before you actually lose credit for the class. So um, that's, to an, that's to answer your question. It's, it was 18. 18. So it's nine for a half-year course. Can I make a comment? Full year course, yes. Uh, when Karen got us that absentee numbers, I looked at that, and that's 10%. For one day? For that, that whole week, one day was 25%. But 10% of an 180-day school year is 18. Yes. All those kids are going to lose credit. If they get 18 days so that individual. Individual. Hey, listen, so the math tells me 10% of 180 is 18. Yeah, but what if we're first day out? I'm a student and I attend It doesn't mean someone else is out, you know what I'm saying? No, but no, it's per student. student. Per student. It's still 10%. I think we're saying the same thing. I don't think we are. I'm a student. I attend yeah. East Haven High School for 180 days. Right. I miss 18 days of school. Right. I lose credit. That's right. And I'm, what I'm saying to you is, you're the average example for the math. You're the average. I'm not following you. I don't want to. 10% of the Correct. If you're missing 18 days, you're considered yeah. probably. But our average absenteeism is 10%. That's what I'm telling you. That's not the whole. The whole applies to, in the big picture, think about what that says. I'm not, I'm not necessarily following you, but I'm willing to have an additional conversation. What I can tell you is those accesses, it doesn't matter if it's excused, unexcused, in school, out of school, or expulsion. An absence is an absence relative to chronic absenteeism. That gets confusing because some parents will send in doctor's notes for kids to be excused. Those at the local level for the district, if I'm absent for 25 days, but I have a parent letter for knee surgery for two or, or three of those weeks, I'm not losing credit because I have an excused absence for those three weeks. In the state's eyes, I'm chronically absent, right. but I'm not losing credit at the right. high school. So the state policy and the local policy differ. Actually, we have an attendance policy on the agenda tonight, so we can go through more of the specifics if you'd like. We got a yeah. the new legislation just added that students are allowed to take uh, mental health days as All right. All right. Thank you. So, can, I, um, can we jump back to number one now? Yes. Thank you. So, um, to keep in, in uh, with the agenda for the um, subcommittee, we need to review the invoices for the fiscal year 2021-2022. We need to review the invoices for the 2021-2022 uh, in the amount of 665082 
Sorry. So are there any questions on that? Yes, I have no question. Thank you. Nothing? Jeff? Good? I just want to, you know, this is jumping ahead, but why are the two numbers different? When we get to, when we get to approval of invoices. Uh, there's a, there's a new um, Thank you. copy. All right. I'm sorry. Oh. Right. I stand corrected. Well, it came in since Thursday. <laughs> Well, that's the number I had for the regular, yeah. $977,021.53. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. I stand corrected. Yep. Any questions? No, I'm good. Okay. No. So um, I would take that this um, subcommittee is adjourned. Do, is we, do we motion? Have to get motion? No, no, it? no. Okay. Here we go. We have one minute or not. Yeah, we'll take uh, maybe a few minutes so yep. we can get moving.
of God, Um, to ask if everyone could remain standing just for you know a moment of silence for today, December 14th, um, to honor the students that were lost in a tragedy at Sandy Hook. <laughs> Melissa, roll call attendance, please. Tia De Palma. Here. Jennifer DeLongo. Tom Hennessy. Yes. Dominic Milano. Here. Karen Putney. Here. Erica Santiago. Here. Jack Stacy. Here. Lynn Torello. Here. And Michelle DeLucia. Here. Okay for this evening. My report. Um, as everyone knows, last Wednesday I had the opportunity to go to the CAVE orientation workshop. They had a session for new board members as well as for um, Board of Education leaders. However, CAVE is coming on the 20th um, to do new member orientation. However, I think it would be helpful if everyone was in, was in attendance. So that will be at 6 o'clock on the 20th. Um, during uh, my time at the workshop, I did hear about a program. It's been around for a while. Um, there's going to be new funding made available. We're going to hear a little bit more about it at the workshop. And it's a program that, it's a pretty intense program, and it does take some commitment from the board. Um, but it's for us to receive training on how to use data to drive our agendas to be more student achievement. That would be great. Center, I'll say, um, but it is time commitment. Um, however, they do show in the districts that have went through the training, there have been some remarkable uh, return on their time investment, I'd say. Um, so I just ask that you, I'm, Melissa, you have copies of that info about the program? The Lighthouse Project? Did you print them? Oh, okay. You can grab them during the executive session and hand them to board members. Yeah. Okay. So just a quick little brochure for you to look at, but we're going to hear more from Nick on uh, next Monday. But I think I, I, they do require the majority of the board to be in agreement to commit to this. It, and again, I will say it is a time commitment, but I think it's worth it. So. Do they give the time commitment there? There's three different the scenarios that, that okay. run. All right. It used to be two years intensive training once a month. Um, it is nation, done nationwide. They have scaled it back somewhat. Um, and he'll tell us about the different uh, scenarios. But uh, it's in order for us to be able to look at data and use it to drive not only our initiatives, our policy, but even just the flow of our meetings. So it, it seems very worthwhile. And uh, on that note, um, I have asked our two principals to be here this evening. Um, the board was copied on the email that I sent on behalf of the board on November 16th, um, asking, well, basically informing them of the board's willingness to support any initiatives and asking them to be here tonight to let us know exactly what procedures and measures have been implemented and what they might need from us. And that is all I have for this evening. So I'm going to subcommittees. I, did everyone get their get the email so everyone knows their assignment? I did send that out, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone should have got their assigned sub, well, not subcommittees, committees. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. I don't know if the committee chairs have any reports yet since they're just getting started. Oh, you do? Yeah, okay. Of course. <laughs> All right, so athletics, fine arts. Athletics, I just want to report that the winter sports are underway. Girls basketball is actually playing their first game as we speak. They're in North Brantford. Uh, boys basketball and wrestling will be later this week. Um, we'll be starting out last night, or yesterday afternoon, boys hockey in their very first game uh, defeated Cheshire. The game was played in Hamden. East Haven was victorious 9-7. to seven. Um, <laughs> Not really a defensive battle, but Gennaro Pompano, who's the son of Ray and Maria Pompano, <coughs> uh, who was a freshman, was named player of the game. He had a hat trick, which is three goals, and that included the game-winning goal. Okay. Thank you, 
Jack. You're welcome. Erica, policy? Um, tonight we do have a policy on um, the agenda, um, and there is nothing for community outreach yet. <laughs> See? Which one? <laughs> So um, we already went over the finance and we just got our first budget and then now we are going into some executive session to discuss some um, contracts. Okay. All right. And in instruction and uh, educational resources and student achievement, we have to get up and running for a okay. first meeting. Yes, we'll, we we'll, do. We will connect with Jenna on Jen. that. Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, so I will turn the meeting now over to the superintendent. Yes, um, I'm going to go to the podium because I would like to um, present the NASDAQ awards. So the National School Development Council, in partnership with New England School Development Council, also known as NESDEC, have created the award for academic growth and student leadership and learning. NESDEC supports excellence, equity, and continuous educational improvement in school districts nationwide. This award is presented to students who have consistently pursued a high level of academic effort, serve as positive role models, and exemplify admirable character and accomplishment. Today, we are happy to present two of our outstanding East Haven High School students with this award. Our first student, Emily Mazuko, is an in come on up here, Emily. Congratulations. Emily is an incredibly well-rounded student. She performs at a high level academically, is involved in a number of clubs and activities at East Haven High School, and is a leader amongst the entire student body. She is respected by both her peers and the faculty and is a valued member of the school community. Congratulations, Emily. You're welcome. Our next student, Jake Esposito. Come on up, Jake. Jake is also an exceptional student who excels academically while also committing himself to the school community. He is very active in a number of school organizations and is a true leader within the school. He takes initiative and inspires others to take an active role in improving the school climate. He is an incredible asset to East Haven High School and truly a leader amongst his peers. Congratulations, Jake. Congratulations to Emily and Jake. We're really proud of you. Continue the great work. Just very briefly for our K to five parents, uh, elementary student growth reports will be mailed home. Um, parents should check their email for an elementary student growth report parent guide. There is a little bit of a difference to the visual look of the report cards. The standards have not changed, but we have made sure that the indicators are easy to read and of a um, appropriate for translation for families who would need access to those things. If anyone has any questions about the new format of the report cards, please email me and I look forward to hearing your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. All right, so at this time, the board is going to go into executive session. Do I have a um, motion to go into executive session? Make a motion to go into executive session. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor to go into executive session, say aye. 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 Opposed? Staying. Motion carries, which I think if it's on the agenda, I'm not even sure if we need to actually motion. That was actually a topic during the work. So explain. Ma that. Yeah, it's kind of where we're going.
call our regular meeting back into session. You make note it's uh, 8.31, I believe. I might be off. Right here. Um, and let's begin with the approval of the consent agenda. On our consent agenda for this evening, we have invoices for fiscal year 2021-2022 in the amount of $977,021.53. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the invoices fiscal year 2021-22 in the amount of $977,021.53. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, I'm asking for an I vote to approve the invoices. Um, all in favor to approve the invoices in the amount of $977,021.53 for fiscal year 2021-2022, say aye. 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 Opposed? Staying? Motion carries. We have approval of meeting minutes, special meeting on December 7th, 2021. I make a motion to approve the minutes for December 7, 2021. Second. Does anybody have any questions or comments? That's another great job. So um, in saying that, I will, at this time I will ask for an I vote to approve the special meeting on December 7, 2021. All in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Abstain. Motion carries. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And that brings us to seven, audience of citizens. Is there anyone here who would like to speak this evening? Or do we have anyone online? Uh, it showed one person initially, but they're not on right now. They showed email again. Okay. I just wanted to let everyone know um, I will be timing for each speaker uh, three minutes and then I'll give you a 30 second uh, warning. Thank you. <clears throat> no one online? I don't think. No? All right. Then we will move on. No one here? I don't know. Okay. If anyone's going to come, you can come to the podium and sign in. Oh, looks like not. Okay, so new business. 8.1, discussion of possible. What? I'd Are you speaking? Uh, yes. Oh, right. Oh. I'm here to speak. Just state um, your name and address, please. Joanne Viglione, Brantford, Connecticut. I have three grandsons who attend in the district. And I am here regarding... You need to give your, ad, your full address. 88 Chestnut Street. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, I'm here regarding the fighting at the schools. Um, parents posting fights online. There was a lot of fallout. Tried to make cons constructive suggestions. Dad's in schools. Kids are also living through a pandemic. I have a video that was taken of my grandson being assaulted by a teacher. We filed a complaint at the police department on a Tuesday. We were told the report would be ready on Friday. We called back. This was per our attorney's advice who saw the video. Friday afternoon, when I recall the police department, it wasn't ready. 
Two hours later, an expulsion letter was hand delivered to the home, Friday afternoon. They said that the expulsion hearing was, would be five days later on a Wednesday. That is in con violation of Connecticut State uh, Statutes 10-22-3-D. It's five business days. Any of you parents can find yourself in the same situation we found ourselves. We hired an attorney. When we went to the expulsion hearing, we were greeted by an SRO who then gave uh, a summons to my grandson. So school to prison pipeline, it can happen very easily. Also, at the expulsion meeting, there were no teachers for us to cross-examine. Our attorney was cut off repeatedly. She has a hearing issue. The only person in attendance was Erica Forty, uh, the newly appointed principal. We had no teachers to cross-examine, and when the attorney did go to cross-examine, Excuse me, excuse me, I'm speaking. No, she did, just reminded me, the hearing, you can't really discuss the hearing since it isn't it something that occurs in executive session. And well, we don't have I'm here as a public speaker speaking about the process, how parents and students are not given due process, that my grandson was deprived of due process. There are laws. Also, there is a law and uh, on the Connecticut Department of Education website about the proper use of restraint, even in an imminent threat or uh, fighting. How many teachers in this district have taken the course in use of proper restraint? And how many know what is illegal and what is not legal? 30 seconds. Legal? In any case, um, we hired an attorney. It was very disrespectful. I will say they always, in East Haven, they go for the year-long expulsion when the state of Connecticut, the average day of the, um, the average day is 115 days for expulsion. Time. Also, one more thing, um, expulsion does nothing but alienate the parents. I receive messages in via messenger telling me, F me once, F me twice, by another parent, okay? I think it's extremely disrespectful. I've done nothing but try and offer positive solutions. A teacher doesn't have the right. You have the right to restrain a child. You do not have the right to toss around a child up against lockers. And I may add one thing, as far as expulsions, this district does seem to have a pretty, you know, inconsistent rate. It is a state law that a child who brings drugs to school gets expelled. The school bus driver incident when it was her daughter, she has not been expelled from school. And that Time. is bringing drugs on school property. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak this evening? Did we? Okay. Is it person? Yep. I see that. She, she might have taken it. By <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. So, is there paper sign inside? Sorry, took a bit Oh, not a worry. Yeah. 
Good evening. Um, Shirley Sataski, 53 Borman Road. Um, real quick, I wanted to bring up something. Uh, we all know the other day we got an email sitting by the soft lockdown at the middle school in the academy, which is fine. However, it came to my personal email address. I'm working, I don't check that. Um, one of the concerns that I have is I feel that it should have been a mass of voicemail. You know, you know how you get the, uh, what is it that comes across to us? Right, should have come across to us, our cell phones, our home. So we know something was possibly going on at the schools. So for it to come to our email address where you have to have somebody else call you and tell you, hey, did you see this? I don't like that. I need to know what my son is safe at school. There's no issues going on. Um, not through my personal email. I'm not going to check it for a week. I don't care what's in my personal email address. So I'd appreciate, God forbid, there's ever another situation like that. We get the reverse phone call coming to our phones. We fill out the paperwork at the beginning of the year with our information, cell phones, etc. Nothing. Um, the other thing I would like to bring up to the board is I think with our schools in general, not just into the fighting and stuff like that, because that is a serious situation. I'm not going to harp on that. You know about it. Hopefully you're working on it. Our school securities need to be updated. Going through the school, there's a lot of things that could be done. God forbid there is an incident. So I think that needs to be taken a look at maybe at your next budget meeting or whatever. Take a look at some of the hardware you have on the door, some of the locks you have on the door, <clears throat> things like that. Where can these kids go that's safe in these schools? Right now, nothing. So I uh, just wanted to bring that up, and I'll be willing to give any ideas at any other times if you had another meeting or something. But that's my Thank thoughts. You. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Is there anyone else here in the audience that would like to speak? Online? She's looking. Oh. Oh. Hi, I'm going to give you three minutes and I'll give you a 30 second warning if you can just state your name and address. Lorena Venegas at 73 George Street. Okay, go ahead. Awesome. So I want to make sure that we make clear that children need a safe and secure environment to learn and the adults are in charge right now. And you can definitely, definitely use the Connecticut education laws to do several things, including limiting the entry of items. You can even search items and you can even do um, intakes of if any children give you signs of any things that, that's happening with their behavior. And those are things that we need to do because our families right now are, are in crisis and we do need resources. Here in East Haven, our mayor and town council decided to uh, outsource behavioral mental health in March of 2021. And this is to the detriment of residents. We have substance abuse, suicide, PTSD, depression, anxiety, divorce, uh, domestic abuse, neglect, and that's rippling right now in our local neighborhoods. And the result is a high number of public safety calls. And when you look at this in child development terms, there's going to be a neurological response to trauma that children see. And when they react, they're going to react positively or negatively to the attention that they get. So we, in my perspective, we need more program enrichment. We need more after school programming because we have the money. And if teachers are unavailable, you can hire outside help. For example, in Madison, they have STEM clubs, robotics, video gaming, and they actually give academic achievement trophies to their students, which I thought was excellent. You know, we need to create some positive spaces inside our schools, our rooms to take a break, maybe some peer counseling or reme remediation efforts. Right now, whatever's not working needs to be thought about, and we need to try something. If that fails, we need to try something else. It's gonna be like that for quite a while, especially when parents are still trying to figure out cyberbullying that's happening out here. And it's happening at a younger age where children are in fact threatening each other. And when it escalates, you're seeing the ramifications of that inside of your walls. 
Um, in terms of parenting programs, we do have an FRC grant, and some of those circle of security and those parenting programs can actually be broadened to be offered at K through five. So I would definitely like to see that, and I would love to see some kind of community forum, including the police and elected officials, because I read that patch article and it just wasn't enough. We need, as parents, we need to make sure that our kids are always safe and secure and that you're doing the utmost, and I trust all of you to do the utmost. We have the money, let's get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, I, I do want to remind everyone that each of our schools does have a behavioral um, health clinic that is available for students and families. Maybe if Julie could put out something just with all contact numbers of all different resources that families can easily access. Thumbs that up, might she got. Make it easier. She's there. Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. There you are. Yeah. Julie, could you do that? Maybe just one single sheet so that's an easier access to find all the different phone numbers. For all the school-based health plans. Yeah. Sure. OK. Great. All right. So Thank on that you. note, let's move on. one more No. 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 Actually, we, we, everyone gets three minutes. I just don't appreciate my son, grandson being followed and being asked repeatedly by the nurse to get vaccinated. OK. Well, that's not public okay. comment, so new business. All right, new business, 8.1, discussion and possible action on the approval of the technician MOU as discussed in executive session. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the technician MOU as discussed in executive session. Second. Okay. So we have a second by Karen and Tia. <laughs> Karen can take it. <laughs> Do I have any questions or comments? If not, I'm going to ask for an I vote. All in favor to approve the technician MOU, say aye. 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 Opposed? Same. Motion carries. We have discussion of possible action on the approval of policy 5113.2, attendance and excuses. Um, Eric, do you want to give a little background into that before I ask for a motion? I do. And if it's okay, I'd like to invite Julia because she did some extensive work on this policy and the revision. So what you see is our existing policy and Julie took so much time to go through it and redline it so you can see the changes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Julie's been keeping myself and the board abreast uh, legislative changes that come along that drive the need for policy revision and change. Mm -hmm. um, so. Julie, do you want to just talk a little bit about what you did and highlight some of the changes? Yeah. So the, the oh, thank you. The sheet that you have that is black and red. Um, we contacted Cave for the sample policy because it wasn't even updated on their website yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure of the date. I believe it was in the release of the June or July. Yeah. Right. It was, I think it was mm -hmm. July one. Yeah where some new mandates went into effect in the state of Connecticut, one of those mandates was that all school systems in this school year institute a um, mental health day for students and that students would be allowed to take two mental health days. Um, that, and there are some stipulations. They can't be taken consecutively. They um, require documentation of a parent or guardian notifying the school that the student is taking such day. It also has the, it also requires the school district to review those days, students who are taking mental health days, and to respond accordingly to follow up with them in, in case, you know, the student is in need of um, additional support. So we took our policy that we had and we changed a few things that were outdated um, and those are you can see there is a strike through and if it was red and there isn't a strike through it is new and it's just because there was more to add it was just reorganized a bit um, but if anyone has any questions um, yes. 
No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm only able to ask answer questions to the board. And all of the statutes are um, listed and legal requirements for. So this is um, the new one that is. This is what was changed. Yeah. This is this is it. If you have don't have any changes that you would like made, so everything that was crossed out has been removed. Everything that is in red has been added. Yeah. So this would be a good to go policy. Unless you would like something else in addition changed or, you know what. So it's language. the clean one that would get it's posted the clean to the one website. That we use. I'm just, we <coughs> Very specifically, the, um, the things that were added, very just is that um, there was one B, um, letter B, excuse me, on the student in remote classes or remote in our quarantine engagement would still qualify under that part. And an absence resulting from a student enrolled in grades kindergarten through 12 taking two mental health days during the school year <clears throat> is permitted to do so and and you know for his his or her emotional and psychological well-being in lieu of attending school the student shall not be required to present documentation um, the student shall be required sorry to per shall not shall not yeah. Oh, and right. I'm sorry. It was really controversial when this yes. was put forward mm -hmm. through the legislation. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. The legislation student, says yeah. that they don't have to provide um, documentation, documentation no. or parent or guardian yeah. consent. Mm -hmm. so for high school students, they can. Anyone. They, they did not no specify age, age group. Yeah, it's any K 12 student, very specifically. It says enrolled in grades K through 12. I, yeah. I have a question of that, mm -hmm. just to kind of. So, I have this you know, right with me. little, little, um, you know, a young child wants to, I need a mental health day. What's the process? I mean, the, the parents should bless, bless you. Okay. Are, they're informed, obviously, because but the kid isn't going to It has, it has to, to be noted as a mental health day. So when the child is called in, whether that's the call in from the child, it has to be noted as a mental health day. Uh -oh. But that's the thing. The legislation said they don't have to... They don't need parent consent, so it, yeah. it's very confusing. A lot of people were very upset about that when it was put forward, but it was passed. What generally what? happens when a student is absent, we do a phone call home verifying that. Mm -hmm. So if the parent wasn't notified that the student decided to take a parent uh, mental health day, they are going to get a call asking for verification that their student is absent, at which time the parent can say, Yes, my child's taking a mental health day, and we can mark it as such. Or, I didn't know my child was absent today, so let me go find out more about what's going on. Generally, that happens at the upper grade levels, because at the K-2 level, they're required to be at the bus stop uh, with, with the child, or not, if they're not going to school. Mm -hmm. But it is a little vague, and it is a little conflicted. It is. And this is on the state of Connecticut, everybody in the state Yes, mandated. And this yes. is a it's model, 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 it's a model policy from the yes. yes. Through legislation wow. state, it went in through legislation and yeah. Everyone in the in the legislative meeting was well, I know like at least the board chairs and the superintendents were um, very colorful in the response to this. Because it's very confusing. Against. Pardon? Against? against not the mental health part, but the fact that it doesn't require parent yeah. consent. Yes. I think that puts students at risk, at risk yeah. for safety and security. If I don't know, if I think my kid went to school one day, they're taking a mental health day, and they're not there, and I get a call from the school, it's concerning. So that's why calling the parent so don't know. to report the absence becomes important notification yeah. to the parent so that if they didn't know, they now know. Yeah. So the best part about it is that there is a phone call. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I'm not, as a parent, I mean, I would like to think. It doesn't even matter if you call, you still get a call. Right, mm -hmm. right. which is good. You still yeah. get a call. 
Because what, what ideally, you would just want to know that they're somewhere safe and they're not, you know. Any okay. child who's absent who doesn't get called out by a parent gets a call. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just want to add one thing on page, on the second page on B, because I think this is often misunderstood by families. The note at the top of the page that was added in the text box says that the use of state approved definitions for excused and unexcused absences are for state purposes and for reporting truancy. So every absence is an absence. Even if a family provides a doctor's note and even, um, you, you know, all, all absences count. So I just wanted to make that clear for families because oftentimes they'll say, but those were all excused absences. But the um, districts are not precluded from using separate definitions of such absences mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for their internal uses. Thank right, you. and we do have internal use of saying excused absence or unexcused absence, okay. but it's still an absence. Mm -hmm. When reported to the state, it doesn't. an absence is an absence. It doesn't matter if it's excused or right. not. The state doesn't de delineate, delineate between, between the, the two. two. Mm -hmm. yes. Because 18 is 18, that's yes. okay. Exactly. Excused, I guess. Yep. unexcused, ISS, OSS, expulsion. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. They might. I don't, I they might now. They're watching that, it. That kids are reading the policy and know that they can do this anyway. I mean, I, I just. I, mm -hmm. I, just, I, I mean, is it in your handbook? No, but <laughs> you know, they, they find is. out some somehow. Um, the attendance policy does go in Good the student parent handbook. So it will be in there once wow. updated with this new policy. I'm sure that was probably a question that was raised during the legislation oh, process as well, because I mean, I mean, it's a challenging point, especially having younger grades. Mm -hmm. I think for the older grades, it's, know now. it's an obvious, <laughs> under, you know, understood. But okay. they, they they pass it regardless. So correct. Yeah, what it is, it's a mandate, and we have to adhere to it. All right, so at this time, I'm going to ask if there's any other questions. No. Comments? Then I'm going to ask for a motion, please. Make a motion to approve policy 5113.2, attendance and excuses. Second. Okay. There's no additional questions or comments. I'm going to go ahead and ask for an I vote. All in favor? I don't need a oh, okay. I don't understand this thing. Maybe I'm not spot. I don't understand it at all. So. The child gets a sick day. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of agree with Tommy on that one. I'm a little confused I with this. Call your state but it's, it is what it is, right? Yes. I mean, it is what it, it is. It is what it is. It's being portrayed as that's what it is. That's not what it says here. But whatever. Should we table it? Should we table it? It's a mandate. It's a mandate. What do you mean it doesn't say it, Tom? I, I, well, I don't understand what When does the mandate take effect? It has taken it's effect. Taken effect. So July 1. So we got. Late? We were doing things wrong? No, we were no. waiting for the sample revised policy from no. CAVE, so we had the exact so language. July 1st? Yep. It was. Yeah. It was. Well, a, it was. We were doing wrong. No, well, it was allowed, but we just didn't have a it's policy. A new, it's a new initiative or mandate, if you will. You know what I'm saying, right? Yep. It goes, it, it goes into effect, but we didn't have the sample policy, and I certainly wasn't going to interpret the the law and write policy myself. That's why we elicit the services of Kate. A lot of people were waiting just because of just the basis of what it's saying to be able to get a sample policy, but this is what it is. Okay. I mean, it does make floor. sense. It just gives them the right to take two mental health days. I, re I remember before this was law on yeah. July, July 1, Michelle actually attended legislative I sessions as a Cape board member, and she called me and said, you're not going to believe what's on the table right now. And she told me about it when it was in session. And she was like, no. was, And I'm like, that can't be. That's such a safety and secure. And she told me about it bef when it was in session before it actually came into law. I didn't think, I didn't think it was going to pass. I honestly didn't. Oh, I'm not a believer. Okay. 
You should try coming to the sessions. Yeah, you should. Uh, if I was sitting there, I wouldn't believe it either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was right there with you because I, I, what did I say to you? I know. So every, I'm like, I'm be? telling you, that's exactly what they How said because be? everyone else had that exact okay. response when it was being read to us. Huh? Everyone. Mm -hmm. I already made a motion. Yeah. I already motioned it. Oh. Law. Yeah, motion. It's been yeah. motioned and second. Then I'll be convinced. All right. So at this time, if you have no other question or comments, I'm going to ask for an I vote for the approval of policy 5113.2, attendance and excuses. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Opposed. One opposition. Motion carries. Can I make a comment? One second here. East Haven Girls won 56-46 over North Ooh. Brantford. Yes. Oh. Nice. 56 nice what? 46. Oh, one one. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Just got it. Just oh, came to right. me. 8.3, discussion, impossible board? action on safety and security measures. Um, we did discuss this in executive session. At this time, I'm going to make a motion. I am going to motion that um, we approve the hiring of three additional security personnel at this time as we discuss further measures. I'll second, second. that motion. Okay, so let's open up for discussion. So this is a very much, if I interpret it, you know, so this is a, a good start to look at what's needed and to look at what um, other safety measures can happen in the future, such as, um, you know, maybe gates, um, looking at, and, and no one's taking any of it lightly. We're all very concerned in looking at other, um, uh, like, well, what is RJ's going to get prices for RG's gates and metal detectors. And metal detectors. And that will and be discussed. Open discussion of what we absolutely, you know, more but meetings we, with our. Um, we can't approve until we get a price. Right. So what we know what security guards cost. So that is it's what good we have start. this evening. So, it, I so mean, to be clear, that we're voting on the um, acquisition security. of three additional. Hiring of three additional security Thank personnel. You. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think adding the three guards is a step in the right direction and I'm all for it. And, and as, as we know, there's other initiatives in place that are, are not going to be disclosed just for safety reasons um, and confidentiality. But uh, it is I, safety of the students is, I think, the number one priority of the administrators. And even though you might not realize it and they can't communicate everything that they're doing, they're doing that <laughs> on behalf of student safety. So I think we just all have to keep that in mind. Um, so. Any other questions or comments from the board? If not, I'm going to ask for an I vote to approve the three additional security personnel positions at this time. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. 8.4, discussion and possible action on the approval of dump truck transfer to East Haven Public Works. RJ? So we have, and the maintenance department currently a 2004 Chevy Silverado 3500 diesel dump truck with a sander and plow that has been sitting there for over a year and a half non-functioning. It has rotted floor beds, four-wheel drive issues, and it poses a safety issue to all our employees. And the town has expressed interest in taking that over and doing the repairs themselves to use it as a safety measure um, if trucks go down at public works. So it's been a normal procedure in the past. We're just transferring the asset from Board of Ed property to town property. Um, they are ready to take it tomorrow. I just We just need board approval to transfer that asset. Thank you. So at this time, if there's no clarifying questions, I will ask for a motion. Make a motion to approve the dump truck transfer to the East Haven Public Works. Second. Any further questions or comments? And if not, I'm going to ask for an I vote to approve the transfer of a dump truck to East Haven Public Works. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Brings us to 8.5, discussion of possible action on the approval of hires, rehires, and stipends. I believe everyone should have a list in front of them. At this time, I'm going to ask if there's any clarifying questions. And if not, I will ask for a motion. Ready? I'm ready. I make a motion to do, um, approve 
the hires, rehires, and stipends. Second. All right. So any other questions or comments? All right. So at this time, I'm going to ask for an I vote to approve the list of hires, rehires, and stipends. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. So the December 28th meeting is canceled. Huh? Can I have 8.6? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Well, I'd like to make... I'd like to ask the board for consideration in adding 8.6. Um, the contract um, for the executive secretary to the assistant superintendent. Discussion and possible action on the approval of the contract template for the executive secretary to the super assistant superintendent. Okay, so 8.6 is discussion and possible action to add to the agenda. I guess that would be 8.7? No, it would be 8.6. No, 8. 6. Well, we have to make a motion to add the, the agenda item. So, so do that first, maybe. Yeah. I, do I have a motion to add 8.6? I make a motion to add 8.6 contract um, template? template for the executive secretary. Second. Any questions or comments? If not, I'll ask for an I vote to approve adding 8.6 discussion and possible action on the approval of the contract template for the executive secretary to the assistant superintendent. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Motion carries. That brings us to 8.6. Discussion and possible action on the contract template for the executive secretary for the assistant superintendent. Can you please That's elaborate? Helpful. Yes. So um, our next meeting is until January 11th, and at the last meeting, the board approved um, a hire for um, a data systems integration manager, which left the vacancy for the assistant superintendent executive secretary. At this time, in an effort to fill the position and create the transition, I'm asking the board to approve the template listed here with a salary range no less than 50000 no more than 60000 and the outlined benefit vacation uh, parameters, which are um, exactly the same as the previous contract, so that uh, we can go ahead and get the board's permission in hiring somebody and, and uh, securing their employment under this contract. Okay. Jack, I, I know you have a comment. Does this so, include um, the inclement weather? Yes, it does. It does, Jack. Is that something that can't be done is, from home? I don't is, Jack doesn't like that, Tommy. Tommy, would you like to read it aloud? No, no please. <laughs> yes, it does, Jack. Okay. All right. So do, um, can I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the template so they can hire the um, executive. Contract template for the executive contract secretary the executive and the assistant executive superintendent. Okay. Thank you. For the so second? Second. second. All right. So at this time, are there any questions and comments on this? This is already a budgeted position. It's just a replacement, but it's to get the contract template going so we do not have a, we can get someone in the position as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. No questions or comments? And at this time, I'm going to ask for an I vote to approve the contract template for the executive secretary to the assistant and superintendent. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Stay. Let's go. I'm going to say that tonight so I count to go to sleep. I'm going to say it over and over. Um, all right. So now our next meeting, what's not a meeting, it's the orientation of the 20th. Please take the opportunity to read this, look into it, Google it. I, I would really appreciate everyone's commitment to this. I know it's asking a little bit more than you might have thought, but I think the whole district as well as the students can benefit if we really start concentrating more on student achievement. And everyone understands. But every, see, this is the thing. Everyone here needs to understand how to look at the data and how to use it rather than just listen to it. So I, I, we can't really make changes unless everyone in, understands what, what it's for. So think about it. Nick will tell you much more about it. There's different scenarios, the way we could do the training. If everyone likes, we could maybe set it up virtually, but he, they prefer to only do districts right now, especially because they're going to sign back in legislation for money to cover it that we wouldn't have to pay it because right now it's being paid for by districts, but we should be able to get it, but they want districts to, the majority of the boards to be on board with doing this before they spend the time and resources, you know, providing it. It's here. It's here next Monday night. No, no, no. It's it's new board member orientation. It's not really a meeting. It's only for us. It's a right, workshop. Right. I have to work with that. So I was hoping it would be available. 
Um, okay. When is it? What's the date of it? The 20th. Uh, what time is it? It's at 6. December 20th? That, that's why we put that date out like last month because it was really important for everyone. Okay. All right. Maybe we could push Nick to 6:30. I, 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 because we. I mean, it's really for you. It's it's for for one, two, and three. It's a new board orientation. I just want everyone to be here so everyone can be on the same page together. But if I mean, if the people that it's designed for can't make it, then it's. I mean, what are we doing? I do too. It is, but we need the new members to be there in order for it to to happen. La and last, it's, it's been a long time since we've even had. What if we usually it's the three of us that show up? And that's it. usually yeah. That's what I was wondering. Okay, Seriously. every time in the past seven years. <laughs> oh, seven thirty. Karen, you're working no. till seven thirty. You want to know what we're yeah. they're scheduling out until March now. Would you be able to watch Zoom till seven thirty? Yeah, but we. No, it's no. not. It's not the type of thing that. Oh, okay. It's a Q and A. It's a training. I'm letting you know what the your purpose is, what you should be doing, what you should not be doing, what's appropriate, what's not, what's in our jurisdiction, what's our responsibilities, because we are agents of the state, not the town, and everyone needs to get on board with that. And even our meetings are not public meetings; they're meetings held in public. We, everyone, needs to have, I think, a thorough understanding of exactly what we do here. And I don't know if everyone does. I know I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I mean, I we had the I went to the training for the new board members last Wednesday. You missed I, your time. I didn't have to sit there. I sat with the entire new board from Danbury. Um, I was the only one from East Haven. <laughs> but um, you know, I don't. I don't mind doing it, but at least it made it all worth it to find out about this. But I just kind of, if everyone could try to make it for the 20th. I'll be here. I mean, I just, I, I know here and now, I've been able to get out and we'll three months back. Yeah, but we, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. 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 Motion to adjourn. Yeah. We didn't realize well, let's that. Let's see if Nick can push it until 6.30, please. Yes. But, okay. you know, even if you can, you, I, I don't know Jack. where you work, if you work far away, yeah, yeah. if you can just come after, would that be too hard? My goal would be to get a nice Oh, you mean listen. Well, you know what, maybe I could do, I could ask Nick to cover Lighthouse in the beginning, so then you could listen yeah. at the start, and then by the time you get here, you know, basically we'll do the orientation. Were you planning on coming here? I'm trying to get someone from night to come in an hour early. Oh, okay. I'll put the out at 7.30, but if I can get someone, and they come in at 7, if I can do a handoff at 6, yeah. I'd be able to do that. Okay. Zoom in, but would you still okay. come? So we'll try to push it. Motion to adjourn? It's already It's adjourned. We're done. Oh, you, got, you need so this? Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn.